Section 19 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 4, Imperial Antiquity, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Leo the Great, Part 1. A.D. 390-461. to 461. Foundation of the Papacy. With the great man who forms the subject of this lecture are identified those principles which lay at the foundation of the Roman Catholic power for 1,500 years. I do not say that he is the founder of the Roman Catholic Church, for that is another question. Roman Catholicism, as a polity or government or institution, is one thing, and Roman Catholicism, as a religion, is quite another, although they have often been confounded. As a government or polity, it is peculiar, the result of the experience of ages, adapted to society and nations in a certain state of progress or development, with evils and corruptions, of course, like all other human institutions. As a religion, although it superadded many dogmas and rites which the Protestants do not accept, and for which they can see no divine authority, like auricular confession, the deification of the Virgin, indulgences for sin, and the infallibility of the Pope, Still, it has at the same time defended the cardinal principles of Christian faith and morality, such as the personality and sovereignty of God, the divinity of Christ, salvation in consequence of his sufferings and death, immortality, the final judgment, the necessity of a holy life, temperance, humility, patience, and the virtues which were taught upon the mount and enforced by the original disciples and apostles whose writings are accepted as inspired. In treating so important a subject as that represented by Leo the Great, we must bear in mind these distinctions. While Leo is conceded to have been a devout Christian and a noble defender of the faith as we receive it, one of the lights of the early Christian Church, numbered even among the fathers of the Church with Augustine and Chrysostom, his special claim to greatness is that to him we trace some of the first great developments of the Roman Catholic power as an institution. More than any other one man, he laid the foundation stone of that edifice which alike sheltered and imprisoned the European nations for more than a thousand years. He was not a great theologian like Augustine or a preacher like Chrysostom, but he was a great bishop like Ambrose. Even far greater, inasmuch as he was the organizer of new forces in the administration of his important diocese. In fact, he was a great statesman, as the more able of the popes always aspired to be. He was the associate and equal of princes. It was the sublime effort of Leo to make the Church the guardian of spiritual principles and to give it a theocratic character and aim, which links his name with the mightiest moral movements of the world, and when I speak of the Church, I mean the Church of Rome, as presided over by men who claimed to be the successors of St. Peter, to whom they assert Christ had given the supreme control over all other churches as his vicars on the earth. It was the great object of Leo to substantiate this claim and root it in the minds of the newly converted barbarians, and then institute laws and measures which should make his authority and that of his successors paramount in all spiritual matters, thus centering in his see the general oversight of the Christian Church in all the countries of Europe. It was a theocratic aspiration, one of the grandest that ever entered into the mind of a man of genius, yet, as Protestants now look at it, a usurpation the beginning of a vast system of spiritual tyranny in order to control the minds and consciences of men. It took several centuries to develop this system after Leo was dead. With him it was not a vulgar greed of power, but an inspiration of genius, a grand idea to make the church which he controlled a benign and potent influence on society, and to prevent civilization from being utterly crushed out by the victorious Goths and Vandals. It is the success of this idea which stamps the Church as the great leading power of medieval ages, a power alike majestic and venerable, benignant yet despotic, humble yet arrogant and usurping. But before I can present this subtle contradiction, in all its mighty consequences both for good and evil, I must allude to the Roman See and the condition of society when Leo began his memorable pontificate as the precursor of the Gregories and the Clements of later times. Like all great powers, it was very gradually developed. It was as long in reaching its culminating greatness as that temporal empire which controlled the ancient world. Pagan Rome extended her sway by generals and armies, medieval Rome by her prelates and her principles. However the humble origin of the Church of Rome, in the early part of the 5th century, it was doubtless the greatest see, or seat, of episcopal power in Christendom. The Bishop of Rome had the largest number of dependent bishops, and was the first of clerical dignitaries. 
as early as a d two fifty sixty years before constantine's conversion and during the times of persecution such a man as cyprian metropolitan bishop of carthage yielded to him the precedence and possibly the presidency because his see was the world's metropolis and when the seat of empire was removed to the banks of the bosporus the power of the roman bishop instead of being diminished was rather increased since he was more independent of the emperors than was the bishop of constantinople and especially after rome was taken by the goths he alone possessed the attributes of sovereignty he had already towered as far above ordinary bishops in magnificence and prestige as caesar had above fabricus it was the great name of rome after all which was the mysterious talisman that elevated the bishop of rome above other metropolitans who can estimate the moral power of that glorious name which had awed the world for a thousand years even to barbarians that proud capital was sacred the whole world believed her to be eternal she alone had the prestige of universal dominion the queen of cities might be desolated like babylon or tyre but her influence was indestructible in her very ruins she was majestic her laws her literature and her language still were the pride of nations they revered her as the mother of civilization clung to the remembrance of her glories and refused to let her die she was to the barbarians what athens had been to the romans what modern paris is to the world of fashion what london ever will be to the people of america and australia the center of a proud civilization so the bishops of such a city were great in spite of themselves no matter whether they were remarkable as individuals or not they were the occupants of a great office and while their city ruled the world it was not necessary for them to put forth any new claims to dignity or power no person and no city disputed their preeminence they lived in a marble palace they were clothed in purple and fine linen they were surrounded by sycophants nobles and generals waited in their antechambers they were the companions of princes they controlled enormous revenues they were the successors of the high pontiffs of imperial domination yet for three hundred years few of them were eminent it is not the order of providence that great posts to which men are elected by inferiors should be filled with great men such are always feared and have numerous enemies who defeat their elevation moreover it is only in crises of eminent danger that signal abilities are demanded men are preferred for exalted stations who will do no harm who have talent rather than genius men who have business capacities who have industry and modesty and agreeable manners who if noted for anything are noted for their character hence we do not read of more than two or three bishops for three hundred years who stood out preeminently among their contemporaries and these were inferior to origin who was a teacher in a theological school and to jerome who was a monk in an obscure village even augustine to whose authority in theology the catholic church still professes to bow down as the schools of the middle ages did to aristotle was the bishop of an unimportant see in northern africa only clement in the first century and innocent in the fourth loomed up above their contemporaries as for the rest great as was their dignity as bishops it is absurd to attribute to them schemes for enthralling the world no such plans arose in the bosom of any of them even leo the first merely prepared the way for universal domination he had no such deep laid schemes as gregory the seventh or boniface the eighth the primacy of the bishop of rome was all that was conceded by other bishops for four hundred years and this on the ground of the grandeur of his capital even this was disputed by the bishop of constantinople and continued to be until that capital was taken by the turks but with the waning power glory and wealth of rome decimated pillaged trodden underfoot by goths and vandals rebuked by providence deserted by emperors abandoned to decay and ruined some expedient or new claim to precedency was demanded to prevent the roman bishops from sinking into mediocrity it was at this crisis that the pontificate of leo began in the year 440 it was a gloomy period not only for rome but for civilization the queen of cities had been repeatedly sacked and her treasures destroyed or removed to distant cities her proud citizens had been sold as slaves her noble matrons had been violated her grand palaces had been leveled with the ground her august senators were fugitives and exiles all kinds of calamities overspread the earth and decimated the race war pestilence and famine men in despair hid themselves in caves and monasteries literature and art were crushed no great works of genius appeared the paralysis of despair deadened all the energies of civilized man 
even armies lost their vigor and citizens refused to enlist the old mechanism of the caesars which had kept the empire together for three hundred years after all vitality had fled was worn out the general demoralization had led to a general destruction vice was succeeded by universal violence and that by universal ruin old laws and restraints were no longer of any account a civilization based on material forces and pagan arts had proven a failure the whole world appeared to be on the eve of dissolution to the thoughtful men of the age everything seemed to be involved in one terrific mess of desolation and horror even jerome says a great historian heaped together the awful passages of the old testament on the capture of jerusalem and other eastern cities and the noble lines of virgil on the sack of troy are but feeble descriptions of the night which covered the western empire now leo was the man for such a crisis and seems to have been raised up to devise some new principle of conservation around which the stricken world might rally he stood equally alone and superior says milman in the christian world all that survived of rome of her unbounded ambition of her inflexible will and of her belief in her title to universal dominion seemed concentrated in him alone leo was born in the latter part of the fourth century at rome of noble parents and was intensely roman in all his aspirations he early gave indications of future greatness and was consecrated to a service in which only talent was appreciated when he was nothing but an alkalite whose duty it was to light the lamps and attend on the bishop he was sent to africa and honored with the confidence of the great bishop of hippo and he was only deacon when he was sent by the emperor valentinian the third to heal the division between Aetius and albinus rival generals whose dissensions compromised the safety of the empire he was absent on important missions when the death of sixtus a d four forty left the papacy without a head on leo were all eyes now fixed and he was immediately summoned by the clergy and the people of rome in whom the right of election was vested to take possession of the vacant throne he did not affect unworthiness like gregory in later years but accepted at once the immense responsibility i need not enumerate his measures and acts like all great and patriotic statesmen he selected the wisest and ablest men he could find as subordinates and condescended himself to those details which he inexorably extracted from others he even mounted the neglected pulpit of his metropolitan church to preach to the people like chrysostom and gregory nazianzen at constantinople his sermons are not models of eloquence or style but are practical powerful earnest and orthodox athanasius himself was not more evangelical or ambrose more impressive he was the especial foe of all the heresies which characterized the age he did battle with all who attempted to subvert the nicene creed those whom he especially rebuked were the manicheans men who made the greatest pretension to intellectual culture and advanced knowledge and yet whose lives were disgraced not merely by the most offensive intellectual pride but the most disgraceful vices men who confounded all the principles of moral obligation and who polluted even the atmosphere of rome by downright pagan licentiousness he had no patience with these false philosophers and he had no mercy he even complained of them to the emperor as calvin did of servetus to the civil authorities of geneva which i grant was not to his credit and the result was that these dissolute and pretentious heretics were expelled from the army and from all places of trust and emolument many people in our enlightened times would denounce this treatment as illiberal and persecuting and justly but consider his age and circumstances what was leo to do as the guardian of the faith in those dreadful times was he to suffer those who poisoned all the sources of renovation which then remained to go unrebuked and unpunished he may have said in his defence shall i the bishop of this diocese the appointed guardian of faith and morals in a period of alarming degeneracy shall i armed with the sword of st peter stop to draw the line between injuries inflicted by the tongue and injuries inflicted by the hand shall we defend our persons our property and our lives and take no notice of those who impiously and deliberately would destroy our souls by their envenomed blasphemies shall we allow the wells of water which spring up to everlasting life to be poisoned by the impious atheists and scoffers who in every age set themselves up against christ and his kingdom and are only allowed by god almighty to live as the wild beasts of the deserts or scorpions and serpents are allowed to live let them live but let us defend ourselves against their teeth and fangs are the overseers of god's people in a world of shame to be mere philosophical gallios indifferent to our higher interests is it a christian duty to permit an avalanche of evils to overwhelm the church on the plea of toleration 
shall we suffer when we have the power to prevent it a pandemonium of scoffers and infidels and sentimental casuists to run riot in the city which is entrusted to us to guard not thus will we be disloyal to our trusts men have souls to save and we will come to the rescue with any weapons we can lay our hands upon the church is the only hope of the world not merely in our unsettled times but for all ages and hence i as the guardian of those spiritual principles which lie at the root of all healthy progress in civilization and all religious life will not tamely and ignobly see those principles subverted by dangerous and infidel speculations even if they are attractive to cultivated but irreligious classes such may have been the arguments it is not unreasonable to suppose which influenced the great leo in his undoubted persecutions persecutions we should remember which were then endorsed by the catholic church they would be condemned in our times by all enlightened men but they were the only remedy known in that age against dangerous opinions so leo put down the manicheans and preserved the unity of the faith which was of immeasurable importance in the sea of anarchies which at that time was submerging all the traditions of the past leo also distinguished himself by writing a treatise on the incarnation said to be the ablest which has come down to us from the primitive church he was one of those men who believed in theology as a series of divine declarations to be cordially received whether they are fully grasped by the intellect or not these declarations pertain to most momentous interests and hence transcend in dignity any question which mere philosophy ever attempted to grasp or physical science ever brought forward in spite of the sneers of the infidels or the attacks of savants or the temporary triumph of false opinions let us remember they have endured during the mighty conflicts of the last eighteen hundred years and will endure through all the conflicts of ages the might the majesty and the glory of the kingdom of christ whoever thus conserves truths so important is a great benefactor whether neglected or derided whether despised or persecuted in addition to the labors of leo to preserve the integrity of the received faith among the semi-barbaric western nations his efforts were equally great to heal the disorders of the church he reformed ecclesiastical discipline in africa rent by arian factions and donatist schismatics he curtailed the abuses of metropolitan tyranny in gaul he sent his legates to preside over the councils of ephesus and chalcedon he sat in judgment between vienna and arles he fought for the independence of the church against emperors and barbaric chieftains he encouraged literature and missions and schools and the spread of the bible he was the paragon of a bishop a man of transcendent dignity of character as well as a father of the church universal of whom all christendom should be proud among leo's memorable acts as one of the great lights of his age was the part he was called upon to perform as a powerful intercessor with the barbaric kings when attila with his swarm of mongol conquerors appeared in italy the scourge of god as he was called the instrument of providence in punishing the degenerate rulers and people of the falling empire leo was sent by the affrighted emperor to the barbarians camp to make what terms he could the savage hun who feared not the armies of the emperor stood awestruck we are told before the minister of god and swayed by his eloquence and personal dignity consented to retire from italy for the hand of the princess honoria and when afterwards Gennesaric, at the head of his vandals, became master of the capital, he was likewise influenced by the powerful intercession of the bishop, and consented to spare the lives of the Romans, and preserve the public buildings and churches from conflagration. Gennesaric could not yield up the spoil of the fallen capital, and his soldiers transported to Carthage, the seat of the new Vandal kingdom, the riches and trophies which illustrious generals had won, yea, the treasures of three religions, the gods of the Capitoline temple, the golden candlesticks which titus brought from jerusalem and the sacred vessels which adorned the churches of the christians and which alaric had spared thus far the intrepid bishop of rome for he was nothing more calls forth our sympathy and admiration for the hand he had in establishing the faith and healing the divisions of the church for which he earned the title of saint he taught no errors like origin and pushed out no theological doctrines into a jargon of metaphysics like athanasius he was more practical than jerome and more moderate than augustine but he instituted a claim from motives of policy which subsequently ripened into an irresistible government on which the papal structure as an institution or polity rests he did not put forth this claim however until the old capital of the caesars was humiliated vanquished and completely prostrated as a political power 
when the eternal city was taken a second time and her riches plundered and her proud palaces leveled with the dust when her amphitheater was deserted her senatorial families were driven away as fugitives and sold as slaves and her glory was departed nothing left her but recollections and broken columns and ruined temples and weeping matrons ashes groans and lamentations miseries and most bitter sorrows then did her great bishop intrepid amid general despair lay the foundation of a new empire vaster in its influence if not in its power than that which raised itself up among the nations in the proudest days of vespasian and the antonines leo from one of the devastated hills of rome once crowded with palaces temples and monuments looked out upon the christian world and saw the desolation spoken of by jeremy the prophet as well as by the cumean sibyl all central power hopelessly prostrated law and justice by words provinces wasted decimated and anarchical literature and art crushed vice in all its hateful deformity rampant and multiplying itself false opinions gaining ground christians adopting the errors of paganism soldiers turned into banditti the contemplative hiding themselves in caves and deserts the rich made slaves barbarians everywhere triumphant women shrieking in terror bishops praying in despair a world disordered a pandemonium of devils let loose one terrific and howling mass of moral and physical desolation such as had never been seen since noah entered into the ark amid this dreary wreck of the old civilization which had been supposed to be eternal what were leo's designs and thoughts in this mournful crisis what did he dream of in his sad and afflicted soul to flee into a monastery as good men in general despair and wretchedness did and patiently wait for the coming of his lord and for the new dispensation not at all he contemplated the foundation of a new power which should restore law preserve literature subdue the barbarians introduce a still higher civilization than that which had perished not by bringing back the caesars but by making himself caesar a revived central power which the nations should respect and obey that which the world needed was this new central power to settle difficulties depose tyrants establish a common standard of faith and worship encourage struggling genius and conserve peace who but the church could do this the church was the last hope of the fallen empire the church should put forth her theocratic aspirations the keys of st peter should be more potent than the sceptres of kings the church should not be crushed in the general desolation she was still the mighty power of the world Christianity had taken hold of the hearts and minds of men and raised its voice to console and encourage amid universal despair Men's thoughts were turned to God and to his vice regents. He was mighty to save his promises were a glorious consolation The church should arise put on her beautiful garments and go on from conquering to conquer a theocracy should restore civilization the world wanted a new Christian sovereign reigning by divine right not by armies not by force by an appeal to the future fears and hopes of men force had failed it was divided against itself barbaric chieftains defied the emperors and all temporal powers rival generals desolated provinces the world was plunging into barbarism the imperial scepter was broken not a diadem but a tiara must be the emblem of universal sovereignty not imperial decrees but papal bulls must now rule the world who but the bishop of rome could wear this tiara who but he could be the representative of the new theocracy he was the bishop of the metropolis whose empire could never pass away but his city was in ruins if his claim to precedency rested on the grandeur of his capital he must yield to the bishop of constantinople he must found a new claim not on the greatness and antiquity of his capital but on the superstitious veneration of the christian world a claim which would be accepted now it happened that one of leo's predecessors had instituted such a claim which he would revive and enforce with new energy innocent had maintained forty years before leo that the primacy of the roman see was derived from saint peter that christ had delegated to peter supreme power as chief of the apostles and that he as the successor of saint peter was entitled to his jurisdiction and privileges this is the famous jus divinum principle which constitutes the cornerstone of the papal fabric on this claim was based the subsequent encroachments of the pope 
leo saw the force of this claim and adopted it and entrenched himself behind it and became forthwith more formidable than any of his predecessors or any living bishop and he was sure that so long as the claim was allowed no matter whether his city was great or small his successors would become the spiritual dictators of christendom the dignity and power of the roman bishop were now based on a new foundation he was still venerable from the souvenirs of the empire but more potent as the successor of the chief of the apostles ambrose had successfully asserted the independent spiritual power of the bishops leo seized that sceptre and claimed it for the bishop of rome end of section nineteen section twenty of beacon lights of history volume four imperial antiquity by john lord this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Leo the Great, Part Two. Protestants are surprised and indignant that this haughty and false claim, as they view it, should have been allowed. It only shows to what depth of superstition the Christian world had already sunk. What an insult to the reason and learning of the world! What preposterous arrogance and assumption! where are the proofs that st peter was really the first bishop of rome even and if he were where are the scripture proofs that he had precedency over the other apostles and more where do we learn in the scriptures that any prerogative could be transmitted to successors where do we find that the successors of peter were entitled to jurisdiction over the whole church christ it is true makes use of the expression of a rock on which his church should be built but christ himself is the rock not a mortal man other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ a truth reiterated even by saint augustine the great and acknowledged theologian of the catholic church although augustine's views of sin and depravity are no more relished by the roman catholics of our day than the doctrines of luther himself who drew his theological system like calvin from augustine more than from any other man except saint paul but arrogant and unfounded as was the claim of leo that peter not christ was the rock on which the church is founded it was generally accepted by the bishops of the day everything tended to confirm it especially the universal ideal of a necessary unity of the church there must be a head of the church on earth and who could be lawfully head other than the successor of the apostle to whom christ had given the keys of heaven and hell but this claim considering the age when it was first advanced had the inspiration of genius it was most opportune the bishop of rome would soon have been reduced to the condition of other metropolitans had his dignity rested on the greatness of his capital he now became the interpreter of his own decrees an arch pontiff ruling by divine right his power became indefinite and unlimited just in proportion to the depths of the religious sentiment of the newly converted barbarians would be his ascendancy over them and the germanic races were religious peoples like the early greeks and romans tacitus points out this sentiment of religion as one of their leading characteristics it was not the worship of ancestors as among the aryan races until grecian and roman civilization was developed it was more like the worship of the invisible powers of nature for in the rock the mountain the river the forest the sun the stars the storms the rude teutonic mind saw a protecting or avenging deity they easily transferred to the christian clergy the reverence they had bestowed on the old priests of odin of Phaea and of Thor. Reverence was one of the great sentiments of our German ancestors. It was only among such a people that an overpowering spiritual despotism could be maintained. The Pope became to them the vice-regent of the great power which they adored. The records of the race do not show such another absorbing pietism as was seen in the monastic retreats of the Middle Ages, except among the Brahmins and Buddhists of India. This religious fervor the Popes were to make use of to extend their empire and that nothing might be wanted to cement their power which had been thus assured the emperor valentinian the third a monarch controlled by leo passed in the year four forty five this celebrated decree the primary of the apostolic see having been established by the merit of saint peter its founder the sacred council of nice and the dignity of the city of rome we thus declare our irrevocable edict that all bishops whether in gaul or elsewhere shall make no innovation without the sanction of the bishop of rome and that the apostolic see may remain inviolable all bishops who shall refuse to appear before the tribunal of the bishop of rome when cited shall be constrained to appear by the governor of the province 
thus firmly was the papacy rooted in the middle of the fifth century not only by the encroachments of bishops but by the authority of emperors the papal dominion begins as an institution with leo the great as a religion it began when paul and peter preached at rome its institution was peculiar and unique a great spiritual government usurping the attributes of other governments as predicted by daniel and at first benignant ripening into a gloomy tyranny a tyranny so unscrupulous and grasping as to become finally in the eyes of luther an evil power as a religion as i have said it did not widely depart from the primitive creeds until it added to the doctrines generally accepted by the church and even still by protestants those other dogmas which were a means to an end that end the possession of power and its perpetuation among ignorant people yet these dogmas false as they are never succeeded in obscuring wholly the truths which are taught in the gospel or in extinguishing faith in the world in all the encroachments of the papacy in all the triumphs of an unauthorized church polity the flame of true christian piety has been dimmed but not extinguished and when this fatal and ambitious polity shall have passed away before the advance of reason and civilization as other governments have been overturned the lamp of piety will yet burn as in other churches since it will be fed by the bible and the providence of god governments and institutions pass away but not religions certainly not the truths originally declared among the mountains of judea which thus far have proved the elevation of nations it is then the government not the religion which leo inaugurated with which we have to do and let us remember in reference to this government which became so powerful and absolute that leo only laid the foundation he probably did not dream of subjecting the princes of the earth except in matters which pertained to his supremacy as a spiritual ruler his aim was doubtless spiritual not temporal he had no such deep designs as hildebrand and innocent the third cherished the encroachments of later ages he did not anticipate his doctrine was render unto caesar the things which are caesar's and unto god the things which are god's as the vice-regent of the almighty which he felt himself to be in spiritual matters he would institute a guardianship over everything connected with religion even education which can never be properly divorced from it he was the patron of schools as he was of monasteries he could advise kings he could not impose upon them his commands except in church matters as boniface the eighth sought to do he would organize a network of church functionaries not of state officers for he was the head of a great religious institution he would send his legates to the ends of the earth to superintend the work of the church and rebuke princes and protest against wars for he had the religious oversight of christendom now when we consider that there was no central power in europe at this time that the barbaric princes were engaged in endless wars and that a fearful gloom was settling upon everything pertaining to education and peace and order that even the clergy were ignorant and the people superstitious that everything was in confusion tending to a worse confusion to perfect anarchy and barbaric license that provincial councils were no longer held that bishops and abbots were abdicating their noblest functions we feel that the spiritual supremacy which leo aimed to establish had many things to be said in its support that his central rule was a necessity of the times keeping civilization from utter ruin in the first place what a great idea it was to preserve the unity of the church the idea of cyprian and augustine and all the great fathers an idea never exploded and one which we even in these times accept though not in the sense understood by the roman catholics we cannot conceive of the church as established by the apostles without recognizing the necessity of unity in doctrine and discipline who in that age could conserve this unity unless it were a great spiritual monarch in our age books universities theological seminaries the press councils and an enlightened clergy can see that no harm comes to the great republic which recognizes christ as the invisible head not so fifteen hundred years ago the idea of unity could only be realized by the exercise of sufficient power in one man to preserve the integrity of the orthodox faith since ignorance and anarchy covered the earth with their funereal shades the protestants are justly indignant in view of subsequent encroachments and tyrannies but these were not the fault of leo everything good in its day is likely to be perverted the whole history of society is the history of the perversion of institutions originally beneficent take the great foundations for education and other moral and intellectual necessities which were established in the middle ages by good men see how these are perverted and misused even in such glorious universities as oxford and cambridge 
see how soon the primitive institutions of apostles were changed in order to facilitate external conquests and make the church a dignified worldly power not only are we to remember that everything good has been perverted and ever will be but that all governments religious and civil seem to be in one sense expediencies that is adapted to the necessities and circumstances of the times in the bible there are no settled laws definitely laid down for the future government of the church certainly not for the government of states and cities a government which was best for the primitive christians of the first two centuries was not adapted to the condition of the church in the third and fourth centuries else there would not have been bishops if we take a narrow-minded and partisan view of bishops we might say that they always have existed since the times of the apostles the episcopalians might affirm that the early churches were presided over by bishops and the presbyterians that every ordained minister was a bishop that elder and bishop are synonymous but that is a contest about words not things in reality episcopal power as we understand it was not historically developed till there was a large increase in the christian communities especially in great cities where several presbyters were needed one of whom presided over the rest some such episcopal institution i am willing to concede was a necessity although i cannot clearly see the divine authority for it in like manner other changes became necessary which did not militate against the welfare of the church but tended to preserve it new dignities new organizations new institutions for the government of the church successively arose all societies must have a government this is a law recognized in the nature of things so christian society must be organized and ruled according to the necessity of the times and the scriptures do not say what these shall be they are imperative and definite only in matters of faith and morals to guard the faith to purify the morals according to the christian standard overseers officers rulers are required in the early church they were all brethren the second and third century made bishops the next age made archbishops and metropolitans and patriarchs the age which succeeded was the age of leo and the calamities and miseries and anarchies and ignorance of the times especially the rule of barbarians seemed to point to a monarchical head a more theocratic government a government so august and sacred that it could not be resisted and there can be but little doubt that this was the best government for the times let me illustrate by civil governments there is no law laid down in the bible for these in the time of our saviour the world was governed by a universal monarch the imperial rule had become a necessity it was tyrannical but paul as well as christ exhorted his followers to accept it in process of time when the empire fell every old province had a king indeed there were several kings in france as well as in germany and spain the prelates of the church never lifted up their voice against the legality of this feudo kingly rule then came a revolt after the reformation against the government of kings new england and other colonies became small republics almost democracies on the hills of new england with a sparse rural population and small cities the most primitive form of government was the best it was virtually the government of townships the selectmen were the overseers and following the necessities of the times the ministers of the gospel were generally independents or congregationalists not clergy of the established church of old england both the civil and the religious governments which they had were best for the people but what was suited to massachusetts would not be fit for england or france see how our government has insensibly drifted towards a strong central power what must be the future necessities of such great cities as new york philadelphia and chicago where even now self-government is a failure and the real government is in the hands of rings of politicians backed by foreign immigrants and a lawless democracy will the wise the virtuous and the rich put up forever with such misrule as these cities have had especially since the civil war and even if other institutions should gradually be changed to which we now cling with patriotic zeal it may be for the better and not the worse those institutions are the best which best preserve the morals and liberties of the people and such institutions will gradually arise as the country needs unless there shall be a general shipwreck of laws morals and faith which i do not believe will come it is for the preservation of these laws morals and doctrines that all governments are held responsible a change in the government is nothing a decline of morals and faith is everything i make these remarks in order that we may see that the rise of a great central power in the hands of the bishop of rome in the fifth century may have been a great public benefit perhaps a necessity it became corrupt it forgot its mission then it was attacked by luther it ceased to rule england and a part of germany and other countries where there were higher public morals and a purer religious faith 
some fear that the rule of the roman church will be re-established in this country never only its religion the catholic church may plant her prelates in every great city and the whole country may be regarded by them as missionary ground for the re-establishment of the papal polity but the moment this polity raises its head and becomes arrogant and seeks to subvert the other established institutions of the country or prevent the use of the bible in schools it will be struck down even as the jesuits were once banished from france and spain its religion will remain may gain new adherents become the religion of vast multitudes but it is not the faith which the roman catholic church professes to conserve which i fear that is very much like that of protestants in the main it is the institutions, the polity, the government of that church which I speak of, with its questionable means to gain power, its opposition to the free circulation of the Bible, its interference with popular education, its prelatical assumptions, its professed allegiance to a foreign potentate, though as wise and beneficent as Pio Nono or the reigning pope. In the time of Leo there were none of these things. It was a poor, miserable, ignorant, anarchical, superstitious age in such an age the concentration of power in the hands of an intelligent man is always a public benefit certainly it was wielded wisely by leo and for beneficent ends he established the patriotic literature the writings of the great fathers were by him scattered over europe and were studied by the clergy so far as they were able to study anything all the great doctrines of augustine and jerome and athanasius were defended the whole church was made to take the side of orthodoxy and it remained orthodox to the times of bernard and anselm order was restored to the monasteries and they so rapidly gained the respect of princes and good men that they were richly endowed and provision made in them for the education of priests everywhere cathedral schools were established the canon law supplanted in a measure the old customs of the german forests and the rude legislation of feudal chieftains when bishops quarreled with monasteries or with one another or even with barons appeals were sent to rome and justice was decreed in after times these appeals were settled on venal principles but not for centuries the early medieval popes were the defenders of justice and equity and they promoted peace among quarrelsome barons as well as christian truth among divines they set aside to some extent those irascible and controversial councils where good and great men were persecuted for heresy these popes had no small passions to gratify or to stimulate they were the conservators of the peace of europe as all reliable historians testify they were generally very enlightened men the ablest of their times they established canons and laws which were based on wisdom which stood the test of ages and which became venerable precedents the catholic polity was only gradually established sustained by experience and reason and that is the reason why it has been so permanent it was most admirably adapted to rule the ignorant in ages of cruelty and crime and i am inclined to think to rule the ignorant and superstitious everywhere great critics are unanimous in their praises of that wonderful mechanism which ruled the world for one thousand years nor did the popes for several centuries after leo grasp the temporal powers of princes as political monarchs they were at first poor and insignificant the papacy was not politically a great power until the time of hildebrand nor a rich temporal power till nearly the era of the reformation it was a spiritual power chiefly just such as it is destined to become again the organizer of religious forces and so far as these are animated by the gospel and reason they are likely to have a perpetuated influence who can predict the end of a spiritual empire which shows no signs of decay it is not half so corrupt as it was in the time of boniface the eighth or half so feeble as in the time of leo the tenth it is more majestic and venerable than in the time of luther nor are protestants so bitter and one-sided as they were fifty years ago they begin to judge this great power by broader principles to view it as it really is not as antichrist and the scarlet mother but as a venerable institution with great abuses having at heart the interests of those whom it grinds down and deceives but after all i do not in this lecture present the papacy of the eleventh century or the nineteenth but the papacy of the fifth century as organized by leo true its fundamental principles as a government are the same as then these principles i do not admire especially for an enlightened era i only palliate them in reference to the wants of a dark and miserable age and as a critic insist upon their notable success in the age that gave them birth with these remark on the regimen the polity and the government of the church of which leo laid the foundation and which he adapted to barbarous ages when the church was still a struggling power and christianity itself little better than nominal 
long before it had much modified the laws or changed the morals of society long before it had created a new civilization with these remarks acceptable it may be neither to catholics nor to protestants i turn once more to the man himself can you deny his title to the name of great would you take him out of the galaxy of illustrious men whom we still call fathers and saints even gibbon praises his exalted character what would the church of the middle ages have been without such aims and aspirations oh what a benevolent mission the papacy performed in its best ages mitigating the sorrows of the poor raising the humble from degradation opposing slavery and war educating the ignorant scattering the word of god heading off the dreadful tyranny of feudalism elevating the learned to offices of trust shielding the pious from the rapacity of barons recognizing man as man proclaiming christian equalities holding out the hopes of a future life to the penitent believer and proclaiming the sovereignty of intelligence over the reign of brute forces and the rapacity of ungodly men all this did leo and his immediate successors and when he superadded to the functions of a great religious magistrate the virtues of the humblest christian parting with his magnificent patrimony to feed the poor and proclaiming with an eloquence unusual in his time the cardinal doctrines of the christian faith and setting himself as an example of the virtues which he preached we concede his claim to be numbered among the great benefactors of mankind how much worse roman catholicism would have been but for his august example and authority how much better to educate the ignorant people who have souls to save by the patristic than by the heathen literature with all its poison of false philosophies and corrupting stimulants who more than he and his immediate successors taught loyalty to god as the universal sovereign and the virtues generated by a peaceful life patriotism self-denial and faith he was a dictator only as bernard was ruling by the power of learning and sanctity as an original administrative genius he was scarcely surpassed by gregory the seventh above all he sought to establish faith in the world reason had failed the old civilization was a dismal mockery of the aspirations of man the schools of athens could make sophists rhetoricians dialecticians and skeptics but the faith of the fathers could bring philosophers to the foot of the cross what were material conquests to these conquests of the soul to this spiritual reign of the invisible principles of the kingdom of christ so as the vice-regents of almighty power the popes began to reign ridicule not that potent domination what lessons of human experience what great truths of government what principles of love and wisdom are interwoven with it its growth is more suggestive than the rise of any temporal empires it has produced more illustrious men than any european monarchy and it aimed to accomplish far grander ends even obedience to the eternal laws which god has decreed for the public and private lives of men it is invested with more poetic interest its doctors its dignitaries its saints its heroes its missions and its laws rise up before us in sublime grandeur when seriously contemplated it failed at last when no longer needed but it was not until its encroachments and corruptions shocked the reason of the world and showed a painful contrast to those virtues which originally sustained it that earnest men arose in indignation and declared that this perverted institution should no longer be supported by the contributions of more enlightened ages that it had become a tyrannical and dangerous government to be assailed and broken up it has not yet passed away it has survived the reformation and the attacks of its countless enemies how long this power of blended good and evil will remain we cannot predict but one thing we do know that the time will come when all government shall become the kingdoms of our lord and saviour jesus christ and christian truth alone shall so permeate all human institutions that the forces of evil shall be driven for ever into the immensity of eternal night with the pontificate of leo the great that dark period which we call the middle ages may be said to begin the disintegration of society then was complete and the reign of ignorance and superstition had set in with the collapse of the old civilization a new power had become a necessity if anything marked the middle ages it was the reign of priests and nobles this reign it will be my object to present in the next lectures which are to fill the next volume of this work together with subjects closely connected with papal domination and feudal life authorities works of leo edited by quesnel zosimus socrates theodoret fleury's ecclesiastical history tillemont's histoire des empereurs gibbon's decline and fall Bugot's Histoire de la Destruction de Paganism, 
Alexander de Saint Charon's Histoire du Pontificat de Saint Leo le Grand et de son cycle, du Moulin's Vie et Religion de deux papes Leon I et Gregory I, Mayambourg's Histoire du Pontificat de Saint Leon, Arendt's Leo de Grossi und Sein Zeit, Butler's Lives of the Saints, Neander, Milman's Latin Christianity, Biographie Universe, Encyclopedia Britannica, the Church historians universally praise this Pope. End of section 20. End of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 4, Imperial Antiquity, by John Lord.